this regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen from Monday, August 17th to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, very pleased this evening to have some special guests with us this evening. Uh, we have our own town attorney, Wayne Fox. We have Chief Don Anderson. And with us this evening on the phone is attorney um, Tom Gerard, who is managing partner at Howd and Ludorf. Um, uh, lots of professional expertise, specifically in the matter of the police accountability bill, for which we're here tonight to listen to the details of this bill, listen to um, from our chief and our town attorney how this new legislation um, may affect the town of Darien police force. Um, attorney Gerard, we're very pleased that you're with us this evening. I've heard you present on this topic before, so I feel very fortunate to have some of your time. Thank you so much. Sure, uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to be here to speak with you. I understand we are on the record at an open meeting of the Board of Selectmen, and so I'll address my comments uh, accordingly. Uh, my, this is a, a, a complicated bill. There are 46 sections, and the attorneys that train the police officers at the police academies have um, a number of concerns about many sections, but what I'm going to be limiting my concerns to and, and, and explaining to you uh, are, are those sections of the bill that impact lawsuits that could be filed against police officers for money damages, because that's the, that's the part uh, uh, where I focus my practice. I defend the civil rights lawsuits brought against police officers in state and federal courts. Uh, I've been doing that for more than 25 years. And what my plan is, is to talk to you about certain sections of the bill that impact that area of the law, and then I'm happy to answer questions anyone has uh, once, once we get past that. But the section that everyone t uh, talks about the most is section 41 of the new bill, and that's because it creates a new cause of action against police officers. Um, it's very unusual that our legislature would kind of pick on one group of people and say, these people can be sued, um, but others who actually commit the same type of things can't be sued under this bill. This is aimed at police officers only. Uh, and it's in direct reaction to what happened in Minneapolis. Um, and, and I'm not gonna spend time uh, arguing why I don't think we needed this kind of legislation in Connecticut because Connecticut does not have the problem that everybody witnessed in Minneapolis. Many people have done that. Um, there, were, there were legislative hearings, and, and so I still believe that, but be that as it may, here we are with this bill, and uh, I, I'm gonna talk to you about what, what we know and what we don't know, because there's a lot that's unclear about this new cause of action against police officers. It's going to have to be fleshed out in a future session of the legislature, or if not, in, in the courts. As we get the cases in, uh, the courts are going to be um, making judgments about what they thought the legislature meant when they said this or that. But what we do know is uh, this Section 41 establishes a, a new lawsuit so against Connecticut police officers for deprivation of what they call the equal protection of the laws of this state or of the equal privileges and immunities under the laws of this state. So they don't tell us exactly what the laws of the state are that they're talking about that you could bring a lawsuit for uh, uh, under, this, under this new law. What they do reference, one thing they reference is the Connecticut Constitution. Uh, and the Connecticut Constitution does have a provision in the, in the first section of it that reads, all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in rights. Period. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything else. So what we know is, is that there's some kind of equal rights violation that, that can be sought, uh, 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 that you can seek money damages for in, in, uh, in the state of Connecticut, but we don't know exactly what. We also don't know 
how this is going to be proved in the courts. Typically, when you have an equal rights type claim, a person who brings the lawsuit has to demonstrate that there was someone else who was similarly situated in all material respect, but you, but you were treated differently than them. And it was for some bad faith type reason, like your race, your gender, your national origin, or whatever. It doesn't. We don't know what the rules are in a lawsuit like this because nothing has been laid out for us. Uh, so either we'll get new legislation on that, or the courts will have to uh, uh, try and figure it out uh, through the normal court and the appellate process. But one thing that's very important, as this bill is written, this does not limit the claims against police officers to race, even though it was the racial injustice that we all witnessed in Minneapolis that inspired this legislation. So as written, this law allows a suit against a police officer for unequal treatment based on any protected classification, which might mean it could be race, it might be because of gender, I was treated differently because I'm a man or I'm a woman, uh, it could be religion, I was treated differently because I'm this religion or that, it could be national origin, it could be sexual orientation, and just to name a few. So it's overly broad for sure in that regard, uh, and, but uh, this is what we have, and so we have to, um, we have to live with it, uh, and, and by that I mean this is a past signed piece of leg legislation that we can either have the legislature change or have courts interpret in a way that, uh, um, in, in my opinion, makes a little more sense. But here are some other observations about this new cause of action. It, once again, it's against police officers only. It's not against public officials, Board of Education employees, anyone else, police officers. Um, the police officers are required to be sued. I'm sorry, are required to be defended if they are sued by the municipalities. And I know that that um, that uh, that was, I, I guess, an issue of, of, of some concern. I know that the, the public entity insurance carriers are being asked about that, and I know that they intend to treat this type of lawsuit like any other for civil rights violation, and that is the police officers are going to be defended, meaning they won't have to retain their own lawyers, but if they are found to have acted with willful, reckless, or malicious conduct, then they will not be indemnified. And what that means is if they lose the lawsuit and they are ordered to pay damages, the insurance companies are not going to be paying the damages, and the towns under this legislation are not required to pay those damages either. So um, that, I will tell you this, that's not that different than existing law. Um, I, everyone in this field is raised with the thought that if you commit a willful or malicious um, uh, type of act and you are found liable and you're ordered to pay damages, then you may be liable on, you may be responsible on your own for paying um, all those damages. So uh, there is an immunity that, and this is what the, the point of the, um, of the most contention in the legislative process, there is an immunity that the police officers can raise as a defense in this, in the, uh, to, to a claim under this statute. And the immunity already exists in other civil rights claims. It's called qualified immunity. That's kind of a trade name for it. There's nothing magical about the name, but it's, it's this doctrine that's referred to as qualified immunity, and it applies whenever a police officer is acting in an objectively reasonable manner. He or she gets the benefit of the doubt, um, even if uh, what, what they have done is deemed to have violated a law. Um, and what that means is, is if the law was clearly established that what the police officer was doing was wrong, then, then, then the police officer will not get the immunity. But if there's doubt about that, if reasonable police officers could disagree about the, legal, uh, the lawfulness of conduct, then the police officer gets the benefit of the doubt and qualified immunity applies. The Connecticut legislature did not like that. They thought that too many police officers were getting away with qualified immunity too often, and I don't think that's the case, but they thought that was the case. 
And so what they tried to do was to make qualified immunity harder to obtain. And what they did was they added a good faith component to the qualified immunity analysis. So the police officer not only has to be acting uh, reasonable, meaning that the law wasn't clearly established that what they were doing was unlawful, but they also has to act, have acted with good faith. And so the, the, the words good faith are introduced into this statute, and the police officer has to not only prove that he or she was acting uh, 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 it, with objective reasonableness, which means that in accordance with are not violative of clearly established law, but also has to show that in, in his personal thoughts or in his heart, so to speak, that he had good faith, meaning he was not intending to harm anyone. So they've introduced this second element of the qualified immunity defense as a means of stopping police officers from winning summary judgment based on qualified immunity. Many of them flat out said that in the legislative hearings that I listened to uh, uh, during uh, the debate on this, on this bill. So um, they succeeded in that mission. Qualified immunity will be harder to win as a result of this bill than it, than it would be if, for example, an equal protection claim was brought under the existing laws before Section 41 where you could raise qualified immunity. So they, um, the uh, goal has been achieved that it will be harder to win qualified immunity we will be able to still raise qualified immunity and we will still attempt to prove qualified immunity. The problem is it's going to be harder to prove at summary judgment and, um, and we might have to do that at trial. And that's a big step backwards for Connecticut's police officers because before this bill passed, qualified immunity was a defense that could be raised at summary judgment and if you lose, you could go right to an appellate court in most cases. Uh, whether that be the Court of Appeals in New York City if you're in the federal system or in the Connecticut court system if it's a state, it was, the case was brought in state court. And the, the reason why that was allowed is because the courts have held the qualified immunity doctrine is an immunity from suit. It's not an immunity from liability. And the non-lawyers won't completely understand that, I know. But what they're saying is is that if a, if a police officer has acted uh, it, in, a, in an objectively reasonable manner, he or she should have a means of getting out of a suit early and not have to go through the whole process of discovery and, and, and trial and then win on appeal, you know, if he loses qualified immunity. So if you try, if you go for qualified immunity at summary judgment, and, and this is pre-Section 41, you could go right to the appellate court or the, or the Court of Appeals in New York City and then, and then have them decide whether or not the, the trial judge who denied qualified immunity made the right choice. And, and in many cases, we have uh, in a pretrial proceeding, the, the single judge who hears the summary judgment motion denies summary judgment based on qualified immunity. We go to the Court of Appeals, and it's a three-judge panel, and they reverse, and they enter judgment for the officers, and it's over. And they never had to go to trial and, and then have a a possible verdict hanging over their head and all of that. So that's a big step backwards that they've, they've added good faith and they um, uh, have taken away the right to an immediate appeal. So um, that's how this statute reads and, and we're stuck with it unless it gets modified. There is a right to a jury trial. That's, that is, that's good. Um, there is an element of punitive type damages and that is if after a trial the court finds the police officer acted with deliberate, willful, or reckless indifference, the court can award costs and attorney's fees. And in Connecticut, that's what we call common law punitive damages. So that provision is, is in this statute, um, and uh, that would be added on. And punitive damages are not damages that are paid by the town or the insurance carrier. Those are damages that are owed by the police officer. So, um, once again, it shows how important the immunity defense is because you never reach that point where damages are assigned if you can raise qualified immunity and either win or, if you lose, go right to an immediate appeal. Now, this does not apply. Um, this, this new law does not take effect until next July, July 1 of 21. And what that means is 
it only applies to things that happen out in the real world, meaning interactions between police and citizens after July 1 of uh, 2021. It doesn't apply to, like, um, if something happened today, but the lawsuit was brought on July 2nd, that won't count. It'll have to happen. It'll have to be something that happened after um, July of, uh, of July 1st of 2021. So uh, that's basically Section 41. Um, it, I, I know that that uh, this is the one, this is the section that got the most attention during the legislative uh, hearings, and and um, I don't know. It's uh, it, it it I don't think it's going to receive significant changes just because so much time was spent on this on this uh, on this section 41 and um, and uh, and I don't think they that, that anyone has an appetite for changing uh, it what's too bad is uh, there was a vote to delay the passage of this and study it longer uh, I hear from more people and um, that vote almost passed but it but it, I think it missed by one vote that would have been better um, they uh, but that's that. I mean, it was done in a two-week session. A lot of time was spent on it, but, you know, under our public health emergency, it didn't get the same kind of attention it would have received if there were public hearings in each committee and people could come and testify live. Um, they, had, they had information sessions and they had talking sessions. So, I mean, it, it, kind of those boxes were checked. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I come down in the camp that, um, this is an overreaction to what happened in Minnesota because because Connecticut doesn't have that problem, and um, you know police reform is, is 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 something that that I think is a good idea, and there are many of these things that are constructive and will be productive, but to throw a new cause of action together like this, um, I obviously I'm on the side of the police, and so I, I you know I don't think it was a good idea, but here we are, and we will deal with it. Now, that's Section 41. I don't think this is the worst section in the bill because there's another section I want to talk to you about that um, I think will have a much greater impact on everybody's day-to-day -day lives, and that's Section 29. And Section 29 has to do with um, a police officer's use of, uh, of deadly force. All right, so... The ability for a police officer to use deadly force has been changed by this bill if that police officer is a Connecticut police officer. And the, the, the shorthand I use for this is the Connecticut legislature has legislated hesitation into the decision whether or not to use deadly force, and hesitation equals tragedy in, in, in my opinion, and, and, uh, and that's, that's, you know, Sadly, that's how I perceive this playing out. But let's talk about the, 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 the rule before this bill. The rule before this bill was on use of deadly force was established by the United States Supreme Court over 30 years ago. And the Supreme Court said whenever a police officer has a reasonable perception that he or another person is exposed to death or serious physical injury, then deadly force is justified. And that's it. The Supreme Court does not require the police officers to employ less lethal alternatives before resorting to deadly force. The, this, the, the U.S. Supreme Court does not require police officers to attempt de-escalation before resorting to deadly force, nor does the, uh, are the police officers judged by anything they did in the moments leading up to the need and the time when deadly force was used all that matters is at the moment the decision is made by the officer to use deadly force, did he have, or she have a reasonable perception that he or someone else was exposed to death or serious physical injury? Now, that paradigm exists for good reason, and that's been debated for years and years and years in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recognizes that deadly force is, is when, it, when deadly force is used, the situation is never static and calm. It's always tense. It's always uncertain. It's always rapidly evolving. And judgments have to be made, and definitive action has to be taken in split seconds. 
I mean, we look at events in courtrooms after the fact, and we'll dissect a five-second period of time in, over like a three-day period of everybody saying, well, what happened this and why not that? And, and we're talking about something that happens in five seconds where police officers need to make split-second judgments, relying on training, and they get plenty of training on, on when to use deadly force and when not to, what the shoot, don't shoot situations are, and they train specifically on that skill, making split-second decisions, and it's always a judgment call, but the Supreme Court has recognized we want them to have the freedom to use their training and to make those split-second decisions without worrying about being tagged by 2020 hindsight after the fact, you know, when, when everything is calm and you're in the nice safe confines of a courtroom and you're not out there anything close to what the police officer saw when he or she had to use the deadly force. So that's the Supreme Court rule. What the Connecticut law does, this section 29, it now takes this mandated approach that when you're determining whether or not it was reasonable for the police officer to have that perception I talked to you about, uh, that, that he or she uh, um, was exposed to death or serious physical injury or a third person was, it says when considering whether that was objectively reasonable, you must consider. So this means this is what the juries will be charged when we're trying cases. You must consider, one, whether the suspect appeared to have a deadly weapon, I'll get back to that in a minute, Two, whether the police officer engaged in reasonable de-escalation attempts. And three, whether the police officer's own conduct increased the risk that deadly force would need to be used. There's problems with every one of these parameters. The first one, and I think the legislature just missed it in their research, deadly weapon has a specific definition in the general statutes. It's not like you and I might think of what constitutes a deadly weapon. A deadly weapon, it, it says um, a weapon from which a shot may be discharged or a switchblade knife, a gravity knife, a billy, a billy jack, a bludgeon, or metal knuckles. Now, this is a very old law that defines it, but it's still the law in the state of Connecticut that we're bound by. There are many, many things that can cause death or serious physical injury besides that list that I just gave you. For example, how about a regular knife? How about a regular knife with a six-inch blade? All right, that doesn't qualify under this statute. So we're, we're now telling, I mean, that's something I hope they fix because they could say deadly weapon or dangerous instrument, instrument because dangerous instrument is also defined under Connecticut law, and that would pick up a lot of these other weapons. But, you know, a car can be a deadly weapon. Many, many, many things can be a deadly weapon, um, and, and uh, it's far beyond what's defined here. So what, what our legislature is telling the police in this statute is when you are about to use deadly force because you perceive that somebody is about to be killed by someone else and you're going to protect them, you have to make sure they have a deadly weapon that meets this statute, meaning one of those six or seven enumerated things um, and, and not just something that is certainly capable of killing, but it isn't in the statute. Because if you don't, you're going to get sued. And if you get sued, and, 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 and as always happens, they charge you with willful, malicious, reckless conduct, which means you might owe the money yourself if you lose. So your job's on the line, your pension is on the line, your savings are on the line, your, you know, your, your college accounts are on the line, all of that. You have to think about, does he have one of these five or six things that the statute says can constitute a deadly weapon? And that's just, that's flat out wrong. But that's not the worst of it. Section two uh, of, this, of this analysis, this mandated requirement on determining whether there's a reasonable perception is, did the police officer engage in reasonable de-escalation attempts? Now, if that's not legislating hindsight, I don't know what is. So... Someone after the fact is going to be looking at um, uh, the, everything that happened in the, in the, you know, the five, the six, the six seconds, the two seconds, however long something takes, and say, did the police officer engage in reasonable de-escalation attempts? And so, that the, you know, any officer who's been sued, you know, has had to sit through a deposition, well, did you consider uh, telling someone this, that, or that, you know, and, then, and, and, well, why not? Because, well, because there wasn't any time to. Someone was about to be murdered, and I stopped it. 
well, what if you, if, you know, do you know for sure if you said this, that the person wouldn't have listened to you and just stopped? You're like, well, no one knows anything for sure, but the, the man was about to be killed, and so I protected him. You know, it'll go something like that. And juries are going to be charged. You can consider whether or not the police officer engaged in reasonable de-escalation attempts. Now, here's the third section. The jury is also going to be charged. You must consider whether the police officer's own conduct increased the risk that deadly force would need to be used. So what's going to happen, and this is, this is, an, this is, this is um, enormous hindsight injected into this analysis. There's no other way to analyze this without using hindsight. And they can say, put yourself in the police officer's shoes and just look forward, but did the police officer do anything himself that made the, the um, that increased the risk that deadly force was going to be needed? I mean, increase the risk, what does that mean? If it went from 10% to 11%, did that increase the risk? Well, yes, that did increase the risk by one percentage point, but so now someone has exposure of all those things I told you about because if, you know, if they didn't, if, if, um, the, the, the question is something like this. Did you have your, you had your hand on your weapon as you approached the suspect? If you hadn't had your hand on the weapon, um, he might not have tried to, uh, um, you know, put the knife to the other person's throat. And that's all the second guessing and, and uh, so, and that that increased the risk. Let me give you a very disturbing example. And this is literally the first thought that popped into my head when I read this bill. Imagine we have an armed gunman that gets into an elementary school, all right, and he gets past, somehow he gets past the school resource officer and is now being chased down the hall as, he, as the gunman runs towards a classroom. Under normal circumstances before this bill, the police officer would typically do something like stop, get on the ground, stop or else shoot, and it's not going to be that much longer before the police officer shoots the person with the gun and that would be a justified shoot because it was a reasonable perception that those children who were at the uh, who were about to be approached by this gunman were at death or serious physical injury. I don't know a court in the United States that wouldn't conclude that. Now, what our juries are going to be told they have to consider in determining this reasonableness is: was there reasonable de-escalation attempts, and did any, did the police officer do anything? That would um, that made that increase the risk that deadly force would be needed. Well, so I mean, the hindsight to this police officer would be well. Um, how do you know that he really was going to go, you know use the gun once he got inside <coughs> the classroom? Maybe he just wanted to talk to someone, and they'll find some witness uh, who who knew the person before they came to the elementary school who said, "I'm just going to go in and scare the daylights out of that teacher. I'm so mad about something that happened, etc." So. There was no intent ever to hurt anyone, and, and you know, you will, we'll be looking at things like, and hearing things like that. And, and then on the issue, um, so they, uh, the police officer will be second-guessed about why didn't you try to say something that might de-escalate the situation. Can we talk this out? You know, um, uh, stop there and, and, um, and, and let me approach you. Or they'll be asked, why didn't you go to the principal's office? and let the principal know to tell the teachers to lock the rooms through the intercom because there wasn't time to do that. You know, it would be in the judgment of the police officer. And, and then it'll be you, your own actions increased the risk that this person would need to, would you need to use deadly force in this person. And your own actions were, well, some, you know, you let the guy in the school. Somehow he got by you. And if you only did this, or if you only did that, then you never would have had to use the deadly force. The U.S. Supreme Court doesn't consider any of that to be a, a fair game in, in the qualified immunity analysis. So now the police officer is thinking, as he's running down the hall, have I used everything I'm supposed to for de-escalation? Is there anything I did? You know, I thought the guy was legitimate. He got the, a crack in the door open and then and then pushed through me and now got by me. <clears throat> is someone going to say to me after the fact, three years later in a courtroom with everything I've, I've earned in my career and saved in, in my life on the line, that you increased the risk because you didn't do something that didn't let, that let this guy in, you know, and, and this guy got in. So you, you know what the real sad message is here? 
is that the police officer will know that if I don't do anything, I'm never going to face that, um, that series of questions. I might be criticized for not doing anything, but I'm not going to lose my house, my job, my savings, you know, my family, all of that. And so you're legislating hesitation. And I mean, imagine how everybody felt when we, when we read the story about the police officer who stayed outside and waited for backup in Parkland, Florida. And it was saying, oh, come on. I mean, and, and I, don't, I honestly don't believe there's a Connecticut police officer that would do that regardless. But that's what the legislature is telling them is a way to make sure you don't get sued. Hesitate, analyze. Deadly force is an absolute last resort. And in that hesitation, if the gunman gets inside a door and locks it, then the police officer is no use. And then we read about another horrible tragedy. So what I didn't like about this legislation is is that there's wisdom to this, to this balance that the Supreme Court of the United States has struck over the last 30 years on when it's okay to use deadly force and when it isn't, what we want to have our police officers worrying about before using deadly force and what we don't. And Connecticut has taken that and said, we want them to worry about even more than that because we're telling them the jurors who are judging them later on with everything they've ever earned at risk are going to be told to analyze whether or not they de- they tried to de-escalate and whether or not uh, they did anything that increased the risk, you know, uh, it, which, which is uh, uh, horribly unfair, in my opinion. And speaking of unfair, um, think about our veteran police officers. I know I'm going on a long time. I'm, I'm just about done. But our veteran officers have been trained on this Supreme Court standard for their entire careers because it was it was basically – founded in 1985 in the case of Tennessee versus Garner. So any active police officer has been trained on this Tennessee versus Garner standard, and they now have to unlearn that. They have to untrain their instincts that they've developed over all the years. Uh, And then I'm sure everybody knows police officers don't just get trained at the police academy. They're in constant retraining. They have recertification uh, training that I think is a minimum of 60 hours every three years. And on deadly force, it's every year, uh, year in, year out. They have to unlearn that and learn the Connecticut rules. And so now they're going to be required to review the Connecticut rules and have those flash through their mind and enter a calculus when they're faced with a deadly force situation. So I fall into the category of Connecticut citizens are less safe because of Section 29. I think that's that's the one I really want them to change. It doesn't take effect till next April. I'm telling everyone who listened to me what I've told you now tonight, and I'm hoping that they go back to the Tennessee versus Garner standard so that the, the training that the police officers learned about in the academy and all through recertification training throughout their careers, they can rely on those instincts and, um, and, uh, and we'll all be safer for it. <laughs> Those are the two main sections. There's other things that, that I, I, it might be more appropriate for a, a, a legislative hearing to, t- to talk about. Uh, you know, they have a duty to intervene that is a very onerous that police officers can be arrested and charged with a felony if, if they are, um, are accused of seeing another police officer violate civil rights and they don't report it. Well, I mean, you know, there's 30 officers on a police scene. It won't happen in Darien, but some of the larger cities there are many, many responses, and uh, so if one person does one thing in a dark area at one time, is everyone now subject to being arrested for a felony because they could be accused of you were there and you didn't stop it? Um, I don't like that, uh, and that's in Section 30. And then finally, I think the chief's here, so I know uh, they, they've limited the ability for police officers to ask for consent to search a vehicle. And that, that's, a, that's a very useful law enforcement tool. You know, when police officers ask, do you have anything in your trunk? No, I don't. Do you mind if I search? No, go right ahead. You can't do that anymore. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. That, that's, I guess, more for the, the guys that do the training more than, than me. But um, if someone is ever sued for illegal search and that's the paradigm, then they're going to lose money damages and, and potentially have, uh, have themselves personal assets on the line. So uh, that's really that's really my thought about it. I'm happy to keep the conversation going and, and um, answer any questions. 
Tom, thank you very much. That certainly is a lot to digest. I know the bill is um, is very <coughs> um, I will I will ask my board in a moment if they have questions for you specifically, but I'd like to turn it to Wayne Fox for a moment um, for his comments. Just for a moment, Tom has covered most of the salient points. Two things I'd like to mention. Number one, I first of all thank Tom for his willingness to make himself available. I also attended that webinar, as I think Jamie did and the Chief did. Very well done. Uh, Tom won't say it because he's very modest, but he is a very well-known trial lawyer in areas of police liability, not only at the trial level, but also at the appellate level. I've worked with him a number of times on different cases, and he's a very fine lawyer, so I thank him for his time. I'm going to step back and let the Chief jump up here in a second. For purposes of the board understanding what has occurred, and Tom, please jump in and correct me on this, there currently exists a federal cause of action which would allow one to bring a lawsuit claiming there was a denial of equal protection. This creates a new cause of action in the state courts, which I think, Tom's of the opinion, becomes more dangerous because of the de-escalation provision, because of the increased risk of the situation by the police officer, as well as the definition of deadly force. Would you agree with that, Tom? Yeah, uh, yes, I would. Uh, currently, there, the, the, um, there is anyone who believes that their equal rights have been violated can bring a lawsuit in federal or state court under 42 U.S.C. 1983 for violation of their 14th Amendment right to equal protection. And they can get everything that would be asked for in a lawsuit like this. It's just that the rules would be different because the, the, the objective reasonableness of qualified immunity without that good faith component would apply and you would have the right to an immediate appeal. So this was clearly not giving someone, uh, the, the intention in my opinion was not to give a vehicle for people to sue that didn't have one already. It was to make it easier for people to win suits against police officers. And we are not here, as Tom well knows, just to criticize a piece of legislation that the legislature adopted just recently, but to recognize that under this new law, it's going to make the case, cases much longer, much more expensive. Uh, this whole concept of the loss of the interlocutory appeal, which was previously in existence, which resulted in the dismissal of many of these cases, is no longer applicable. That's a real negative for the police department. Secondly, what, what Tom referred to as the hesitation factor, with a police officer going into a school or something of that nature and questioning for his own benefit whether or not he should act or whether he should hesitate. That can result in a dangerous situation and unfortunately more, more the potential for more serious injuries and death. Having said that, I think Tom has covered most of them. This was a very extensive bill. It ran some 75 pages. It dealt with the physical, physical force issue, the definition of a, check, a choke hold when it can be used, the, the, the duty to intervene, the duty to report, gave extensive new powers to the Inspector General to investigate these activities and to prosecute them. So it was, an, it was an extremely broad piece of legislation, which I think will have significant impact and effects down the road. Having said that, I've had occasion to speak with the Chief about it. I know he has a, a few thoughts he would like to share, share with, with your board. Thank you very much, Chief. Appreciate it. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Folks know, I was first employed here prior to Graham versus Connor and Tennessee versus Garner. But those have been the seminal cases since 1985 and 1989, which every police officer in the United States has been operating under, and for good reason. Uh, police officers want to know the law. When you walk into Preston Avenue at the police academy as a rookie, the first day they tell you the officer, you as an officer, are bound to know the law. Well, I have read this 71-page bill time and time and time again, and you need the patience of Job and the wisdom of Solomon to understand everything that's in here. Um, our officers have, we do this, right? Our use of force here in Darien, and I only can speak to Darien, we haven't used deadly force in my career. It hasn't occurred. So 37 years, thankfully, it's not been used. I do not know of one officer, past or present, that had any interest or any desire to use any kind of force, much, much less deadly force. 
However, the desire does not mean you don't have the will to do it when it's required. Uh, the Supreme Court, as far as I'm concerned, has settled law on the use of force and the deadly use of force that is quite fair. It has been litigated time and time and time again. Um, officers want to know what the rules are and know what the laws are. You know, a strike in baseball is from the knees to the letters. This one now makes it shoe top to, to the top of your head. We're not sure where this is going to land, as the, as the council said. Um, there's time here to walk some of this back. Um, I think there is some hesitation that's going to be. The officers are not going to know the law. When we do our training and we bring in training experts on the use of force, our training may have to be done differently. It will have to be done differently. Um, some of, the, some of the wording in this statute have been, has been changed a little bit, shades from our training from federal law, from Tennessee versus Garner and Graham versus Connor. Officers' conduct have always been based on what the reasonable officer would perceive and what the reasonable officer would do there. And if I change the wording to reasonable person, that's not the same thing always in my mind. Because I know plenty of reasonable persons that may not be able to make a reasonable decision based on something like this. You know, doctor's boards for medical practitioners, they're judged by other medical practitioners. Not to say that you have to have a jury of police officers when you have an officer brought up on charges or brought to a suit, but it's not always the same thing. Um, I, think the, I think the council have certainly covered qualified immunity. I really can't add too much to that. I think they have been a pretty good overview of what that is. It expands a new avenue where suits can be filed in the state of Connecticut where you, typically they would be filed in federal court for the most part under 42, 1983. Um, what are the Connecticut courts going to look to if they get these suits? And they will. They will be looking to the Second Circuit and they will be looking to the United States Supreme Court. So we may go all the way around to right back to where we started with because Second Circuit is, you know, covers the state of Connecticut and the United States Supreme Court has been very clear on many of these rulings, including the provocation doctrine is they said that that is not a requirement. You're not looking at what the officer could or couldn't have done at that point. Now, these scenarios are very real and, and officers are thinking about this greatly when deciding what they're going to do. And the, the one is a perfect example with a school shooter. If that officer did anything that couldn't have been done picture perfect, there can be an issue. Well, if you want any police officer to be perfect in every aspect of the penal code and every application of law, there isn't one. You know, there certainly isn't one. Uh, the dangerous instrument being carved out, where it's only a deadly weapon. The council was very clear on this. Well, speaking from experience, it's only happened to me once. But I took a good beating by a guy with a two by four, and there was nobody coming to help me. Now, that wouldn't fall under the deadly weapon, but it certainly was a dangerous instrument. And clearly, I would have had a right to defend myself up to including deadly force from the beating that I was taken by that guy. So I've been there only once or twice, but it is a reality of law enforcement here. Um, the good thing now, we have professional police officers here who operate within the law. They do. They know the law and they operate within the law. Um, we're not using excessive force. Thankfully, we're not using deadly force, but we train as to the fact that you may have to use it at some point. So that's it on qualified immunity. Uh, if you can indulge me a few minutes, I'd like to just talk about several of the other aspects of this bill, or would you like me to come back to address that, the bill as a whole? I think this is a critically important okay. conversation and certainly worth the time, so please go ahead. So like I started at the top, every, this 71 pages should have been, each one of these topics, I think in my mind, should have been its own bill. That's the import of a lot of these things that are in that bill, and they deserve, uh, you know, I don't like the word robust, but I'll say robust discussion on whether or not these are the best avenues for the state of Connecticut as far as ensuring the safety of our population. Um, well, I'll just go through them briefly. Required drug testing of police officers. We've never had drug, drug testing here in the town of Darien except for reasonable suspicion. This law now requires random drug testing for all police officers. Um, Everything doesn't come down to dollars and cents, but there's certainly a dollars and cents uh, computation here. The way they're figuring it out, if you have, we test 20 officers a year, we're looking at probably four or $5,000 a 
for mandatory drug testing. Not reasonable suspicion, just you have to go do it. Philosophically, I'll take a drug test every day. And I think most of my officers would say the same thing. They're, as far as being caught in a drug test, I don't have any issue uh, with any of my officers, not even a hint of a suspect that would have any problem there. But what happens if someone has a failure? What constitutes a failure in a mandatory drug test? Right? Um, will we have to still employ officers who fail a drug test who are decertified by the Post Council? Those are questions that still have to be answered. Uh, what would happen in the State Labor Board? Constitutional challenges. This is, this is an area where we've never been down before with mandatory drug testing statewide. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. The required behavioral health assessment every five years for police officers. Again, this is mandatory. Every five years, you must have a, a, a now uh, an examined by, be examined by a board certified psychologist or psycholo psychologist or psycho experience in diagnosing and treating PTSD. Uh, I've had several people tell me to expect 500, between $500 and $1,000 per test from a licensed clinician to do PTSD type mandatory training for police uh, examinations of police officers. Again, what is the potential for litigation? What's the, what happens if the officer is fined at five years and 10 years, but at 13 years he's not fined anymore or she's not fined anymore? What do we do? There's questions there that have to be uh, worked through. Uh, Connecticut State Police under going uh, post certification, that's fine and dandy with me. All, all police officers now in the state of Connecticut will be under one certification standard. I personally don't know why it never was that way, but it never was that way until this point. Implicit bias training kind of codified in this uh, statute. We do that already. We, we will be doing more of that and we will be complying with any aspect of implicit bias training that the state mandates. Crowd management and crowd control. That's a good idea in this day and age. It's been quite some time since we had formalized crowd control training, but now it's mandated. We have to do it and there will be an expense for training our officers in crowd control and uh, crowd management. Badges and name tags required. I'm not sure what this means. It says all officers have to have a badge and a name tag on their outer garment. Okay, well, we do that on uniformed officers. I don't know if that means the chief has to have a name tag. It, it's, again, I'm not sure what that exactly is gonna come down the pike. Uh, reporting on recruiting, retaining, promoting minority police officers, that applies to municipalities with relatively high concentration of minority residents. That's a quote from the statute. Darianne has been very diligent in trying to make sure that we had a diverse workforce and we will continue to do that even though that's not a requirement. We do that as uh, a standard operating procedure. Uh, the, they're looking at the, the feasibility of police officer professional liability insurance, like the council spoke about. I'm not sure there's any underwriter that might write that policy, nor do I have any idea what it might cost an individual officer to get professional liability insurance. Because you wouldn't be looking at a standard, you know, hold harmless $1 million policy. It would be, it would have to be a multi, multi-million dollar policy to offer any real protection on liability for a police officer. I'm not sure where that, where that will take us. Civilian review boards. This statute allows municipalities to uh, create civilian re review boards for police officers and police departments. We already have that. We've had a long-standing civilian police commission that does just that. So I don't see any reason we need a civilian review board when our police commission operates in that fashion already. Feasibility and social, uh, feasibility and impact of having social workers responding to police calls for service. There's dollars and cents uh, attached to this as well. We go to many, many things that we didn't when I started my career, and we do a pretty good job at it with our crisis intervention training and the quality of our officers. That said, we're not mental health practitioners, we're not. Um, if there's some mechanism in place where we can have a social worker or somebody come to a call and I make the analogy, it's like a fire call or an EMS call. When things are all settled, we can step back and they can step in. I'm all in favor of that. But there certainly is a uh, expenditure attached to having a program like that. But we are working as required to see the feasibility of that happening. 
Dash cams and body cams, no issue there. We're ahead of the curve. We have both. They work together. We have one system now in our cars that operate the body cam as well. It's largely an automated type uh, system where if your car goes over 70 miles an hour or if you activate the emergency lights, your body cam and your dash cam go on automatically. So we're ahead of the curve there. And I am a proponent of dash cams and body cams as I've been from the beginning. I do think it does offer a level of protection both to the public and to the officer. Consent searches. I don't agree with this one. The law of the land here is willing and knowledgeable and voluntary consent is what the law is. So if an officer asks you for consent and, he, and you grant him true, knowing, voluntary, and willful consent, that's good. Well, we can't do that anymore. So as written, that's, that, is, that is out, asking anybody for consent. Use of force, I think council touched on pretty well. Those two seminal cases, we have trained and trained and trained on that for 35 plus years. And this does change things a little bit where we're not quite as sure as where we were before this bill was passed. There is time between now and July of 2021 that we can make some inroads. I think reasonable folks can make some inroads to get this more clear and more in line to what we had before. Use of force reporting. I'm all in favor of this. We do it already. It's kind of bifurcated in the state of Connecticut where if you use a, uh, like a taser or CEW, that gets reported over here. Racial profiling gets reported over here. Use of force gets reported over here. I, I've been clamoring for a single portal for use of force and police reporting in the state of Connecticut for some time. I hope we can get to that point where we send it to one place and they can, they can uh, look at the data and report back. Duty to intervene. And we're not sure where that's going to go. They're talking about potentially an officer could be charged under 53A-8, criminal liability for acts of another. Well, clearly, if we have an officer here that sees someone using excessive or illegal force, they are going to intervene. There's no doubt in my mind. Or if they see something that rises to the level of illegal or excessive force, not only will they intervene, they will report it to me as well. It comes a little muddier, though, however, if you happen to hear something. Right? Or what happens if you hear something about an officer in another department that you weren't there but you, you hear something or you see a social media post, that's a little muddier of, in my mind where those waters are. So we're going to have to get some more clarification on what that exactly means. Quotas. Now again, the law, this new law states pedestrian citation quotas. I don't know what that is. No one can give me an answer thus far. Does that mean a pedestrian like someone that is walking? Or does that mean a run-of-the-mill motor vehicle stop, a quota? Well, quotas have been prohibited by Connecticut statute for my entire career. We've never had a quota. We have never will have a quota. It's just it's, it's, it's not a non-issue for us because we do not have a quota of any type for anything. Controlled equipment obtained under the federal 1033 program. We don't have anything. There's nothing we would have to give back. We don't have any armored drones. We don't have any military equipment. We, we don't have any of these things that are listed there. I think the, maybe the last thing or the, moment, the main thing that I think we got under a 1033 program is they gave us a big heavy duty shredder that came off a nuclear submarine. And we used that shredder for years and years. So. And then qualified immunity. I, I cannot explain it any better than council did. Not an attorney, as you've heard me say many times, but I am a student of the law, and uh, I want to know the law, and I want our officers to know the law. So, the last thing I have for you is CALEA accreditation, and this is something that the town has to know about. The first draft of this law said that by 2025, all Connecticut police departments would have to be accredited. Darien Police Department is accredited from, by post, three, uh, post C to the Tier 2 standard. There's three tiers in Connecticut. We're accredited to tier two, which covers the lion's share of what a, a professional police, office, uh, police department should be doing. CALEA is a whole different animal. The CALEA is the Commission for the Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, I believe is what it is. It is a, a national group that I think there's only a thousand police departments in the state of Connecticut that have CALEA accreditation. There's over 400 standards that you must meet to be CALEA uh, accredited. Uh, 
if this stands, and like I said, the first version didn't say anything about CALEA, it just said accreditation. But when it came down at the end, CALEA accreditation is what was required. Uh, if we have to have that by 2025, we have to have this mechanism in place. It's a minimum of two years to get to that level before you can have an assessor come and, and uh, a group of assessors come to your department to see if they're going to accredit, you know, accredit you. So we will need a full-time employee to do that. And that's not just based on my say-so. I have spoken to many, many departments who are accredited to that CLIA standard. It's a full-time employee. It doesn't have to be a sworn employee, but it has to be a very driven, focused, and dedicated employee because the standards here are too important to miss. And let's be, I'll be very blunt, the CLIA does not guarantee success. There are some CLIA accredited agencies across the United States that are now under federal consent decrees because they didn't get it right. So it's not a guarantee, but it does ensure that you're doing best practices. Uh, there's some agencies that had to spend multi, multi hundreds of thousands of dollars just on their physical plant to get it to meet the standards of what CALEA requires, their actual building. So mm -hmm. I think we're good building-wise. I think we're good talent-wise. But if that's something that we have to do coming down the pike, I will be coming to the board because we will need an employee to do that. That's what I got for you. I'm happy to answer any questions. I could talk about this, you know, for hours on end, but Kate's going to shoot me with a paper clip or something <laughs> if, I, if I go too long. Uh, anytime anyone on this board has a question, you know where to find me. I'm more than happy to talk on the phone or have a cup of coffee. Uh, it's the doctrine of the reasonable officer, right? Most of the things in any statute come down to a reasonableness standard on both the part of the officer and the member of the public. If you're both doing something that's reasonable, we don't have these instances that come down the pipe where these conflicts and disputes arise. Um, I think our officers do a good job of being reasonable, being fair, and being even-handed, and none of our officers are out there looking to use force, especially deadly force. They will if they, if they have to, and that's been our standard for my whole time here, and, and that is going to continue. Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Wayne and Tom, I want to thank you. I want to give my board the opportunity if there's any specific questions that you would like to ask of any of the professionals this evening, please. Sarah, <coughs> I'd like to ask a question. <coughs> Excuse me. First, I'd like to commend our stellar Darien Police Department, so thank you very much. It, we are very proud of our police department. Help me to understand if an officer in good faith, reasonable action is discharging his duties, approaching a school shooter situation would hesitate if they're doing all of the things that they have been taught and you, if you want to go up the podium please um, help me to understand why there would be a hesitation if the officer in good faith discharging a student's reasonable actions why that would be an issue uh, um, is that I, something I can address Jamie um, the, let me first go to the chief uh, the question was addressed to the chief but um, so I'll give you an opportunity go ahead chief I don't think our officers would hesitate but I think that the concept in the back of their mind would be there. But my point to that is the suit that is brought will guaranteed say that this was a hesitation or an error on the part of the officer. Whether it truly was or truly wasn't, that will be the crux of the suit that will be brought in state court because it's an easier avenue now for bringing these suits. And let's face it, most 1983 deprivation of rights, equal rights suits uh, are settled. Not, a lot of them don't go to trial. Um, again, it's dollars and cents a lot of times. We're an insurance carrier. It's more advantageous to settle a suit. Well, from where this officer stands, if I'm 100% in the right and I did everything according to established law and I did it according to training and state statute, it, it's a little disheartening when a suit is settled with no, with no uh, resolution. I don't think our officer would, hes would hesitate in a, in a uh, school shooting situation. I mean, I'm, I'm quite confident they would not. Um, but I, I do know that the, the specter of being second-guessed that is there now that wasn't there before, especially with the provocation doctrine that they're trying to promote where you, if, you, if, you didn't, if you did something that, that caused it to be uh, exacerbated that you could be held liable or that you didn't use every available de-escalation technique that was reasonable before you used deadly force or attempted to, uh, that's a high standard um, to be held to, and that's just not, that's not, just not reality. 
Officers just cannot be perfect all the time. We train to the nth degree, and I think we are probably the highest trained uh, department in our agency, and it shows based on our results. Um, but there is going to be some hesitation on part of the officers, maybe not on a deadly force situation in the school shooting, but on other things out there. Let's think, do you want to get involved? You know, where before, you would be, you might not at that point. You know, you might not. Sarah, does that answer your question? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to hear more. I just was curious um, of that. Yes. Wayne, did you want to make a comment? I'll, I'll let Tom jump in here also. Just, it's a, it's a good question. But under this new standard, in a matter of five seconds, I am a police officer going into a dangerous situation. In my mind, I'm saying to myself, have I engaged in reasonable de-escalation? Have I done anything which resulted in a greater risk of physical harm here than was existing before? Those standards, those new guidelines, can be potentially worrisome to me as an officer. Tom, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, Wayne just said it 100%. I mean, it's so unfair to Connecticut police officers to have them say, um, I have to do this quick calculus in my mind about de-escalation and have I done anything to increase the risk? And I, re I, I indicated earlier that increase uh, a risk of 5% increasing to 6% is a police officer increasing the risk. That is how that law would be interpreted. I mean, it, it, it's very clear. It's how it would be instructed because there's no other way to, to instruct it. So if, if the armed gunman gets in the elementary school by showing that he's the maintenance guy who's going to fix the HVAC, it's a phony ID, and then the police officer, you know, he gives him, before he figures it out, the guy gets away from him. Now he's thinking, I've done something that increased the risk because I let the guy in. And I think Chief said it right that there probably aren't many police officers who are going to let a gunman get into an elementary school and get near kids. They'll take the risk. But how unfair is it to them to say, I'm not, as he's running down the hall after this guy, thinking about his wife and his family and his home and the money he saved for college and retirement? And saying this is all on the risk, but I've got to put it on. I got to do it. You know, I mean that that's the point of that. Thank you, Tom. Yes, Kate. You know, I would wonder or worry um, not about that first instance where you know our cop goes and does the right thing, right, and then he gets sued for having done the right thing, and now we have an officer who is under stress because he's afraid of losing his home, what it's going to do to his family. So. It's not just in that one instance, it's in the instances after that we've got to be concerned about our, our men and women. That's a good point. Krista. I um, just want a clarification on back on the qualified immunity with the addition of the good faith clause, as I understand it, that the path used to go to the appellate court where it would be worked out amongst the parties and now it will not be. Where does it go now? What would be the path for this instance? Which I understand it involves discovery, et cetera. Thank you, Chief. Currently, prior to this law, it could be appealed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City. Even if all the even if all the issues were not settled, you could take an appeal immediately to that court to get a ruling on one section of that statute. The council now you can, have to wait till the trial is finished. Now you have to go all the way to the end of the trial. So right now, if you go into court and uh, the attorney files a motion for summary judgment for you and lays out the facts and they're like, yeah, this, the officer did everything 100% right. They make a motion for summary judgment, they get the officer qualified immunity and the case is over. So there's, a, there's, a, there's this misconception out there that qualified immunity suddenly or somehow protects officers from misdeeds, which is not the case. That's the rhetoric that I think is out there, that qualified immunity equals officer gets to skate from doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. Clearly not the case. Okay, the other important point, thank you for clarifying. So now they need to go to the end of the trial, time, money, to one of the probably the same situation. Yeah, under this state statute, and counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, the trial has to be seen to the end. Okay. Then an appeal can happen. Again, at greater expense to the municipality and potentially to the, the attorney, uh, to the uh, municipality for the attorneys on our behalf. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think it's a shortcut. It's justice being served, and it's a long-standing federal standard that for my entire career we've been operating under. Thank you. Elemental fairness in my mind. Okay. Um, 
In the interest of time, I would like to uh, ask if the board has other questions. We can certainly come to you, Chief, to, to Wayne, and Wayne can reach out to Tom if needed. We can certainly come to the Police Commission. Thank you, Brent, for being here. Um, it's uh, a really important and meaty topic. I'm very grateful that you took the time to be with us this evening. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and we will certainly be watching this closely through the next legislative session to see if any modifications are made and how those might affect our local department. So thank you all very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Have a good evening all. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Can I just ask a general question as to as this goes forth, just the process for who's advising whom, how is this being followed, for lack of a better word, in the legislature? Because I'm sure our constituents are interested. Yes, there, there's certainly going to be conversations with groups like the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association. Okay, and so then you would, would be part of that. Yes. Okay. Uh, as far as where we stand on some of these aspects of this law, Mm -hmm. to try to get it to a point where it, it, in our mind, in my mind at least, it would be a more reasonable application of statute. Um, I, I, I'll be quite blunt to say that there is too much in this bill to be put through in a two-week two period. There's things that needed to be discussed in much further detail. Maybe get to the same kind of desired result, but I think it was rushed through here, and I think in some legislatures, at least anecdotally I have heard, have made the statement that they, they weren't sure exactly what they were voting for. And is, Wayne, are you involved in this process also, or is this just so I know someone's following it through? We would course. be involved in it because we follow legislation in general okay. to see what's happening. I will say to you, unfortunately, the legislature will meet again in January, okay. a new legislature for the long session, which runs, runs through June. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Tom that I think the likelihood of this changing significantly is remote. I think there was a great amount of pressure to get it through. Mm -hmm. I think it was, there was a question as to whether or not the votes were there in the Senate, whether or not the governor would sign it. They made some modifications to it that got it through. That's what people wanted to do. And I tend to think they would be reluctant to face that fight again. But there will be pressure put forward by the police associations and others to, to try to make some modifications, and we will watch it. Okay, thank you. And the good news is that um, Dan Fox is in the legislature and will stay on top of this and be able to inform us. And if Dan is listening, you should know he's on vacation in New Jersey. That's why his old man was here. <laughs> well, Thank we appreciate you. that. We appreciate you following this for us. And um, I'm really grateful that you have access to uh, Tom with his expertise in this particular area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, moving on with an expeditious fashion. First selectman report, um, just a couple of things. As you know, storm Issa ES hit us hard on Tuesday, August 4th. It was clear that the storm caused severe widespread damage that our electric utility company was not prepared for. In spite of having an excellent relationship with Eversource, critical make safe efforts, always the first step in response and recovery, did not function as they had during Hurricane Irene, Storm Alfred, and Superstorm Sandy. The problem was consistent statewide across the Eversource service area. Our emergency management team worked around the clock to assist our residents through downed trees, some on homes and cars, downed utility poles, transformers, power lines, fires caused by downed power lines, and blocked roads and neighborhoods. Electric utility restoration was not complete until Wednesday, August 11th, seven days post-storm. We're scheduling an after-action meeting with Eversource, and the Public Utilities Regulatory Agency will be investigating the utility company's response to the storm. I want to extend deep gratitude to the Darien Police, Darien Public Works Department, our firefighters, emergency management director, fire marshal, health department, Karen and Linda in my office, Kate and a host of other town officials who were critical in our response and recovery efforts. Uh, I'm not sure that Eversource understands how much work we do as a municipality, uh, in some cases doing their work for them, but certainly in partnership with them. COVID-19 update since the 7th of August, 
we've had 10 new cases. Five of those were in one family. Um, and in spite of the fact that uh, there are some states that aren't on the travel advisory list. Um, those five family members, I think, were exposed to uh, someone in New York. Um, some of the tests of the 10 new cases that we have date back to July 24th. So I just bring that to your attention so that you can understand the challenges with contact tracing, especially as we move into um, thinking about school reopening and the, the real critical issue of identifying cases sooner rather than later to stop the spread of the virus. Um, and to that point, school reopening, Darien Public Schools are planned to be reopening on September 3rd. They're going to be opening in a hybrid model with the goal to fully open for all students five days a week by September 29th. There's a series of criteria and metrics that will be followed um, to have uh, school attendance sort of toggle between um, fully in session, a hybrid model, and e-learning. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of opinions on how, when, and if school should be reopening. The district is holding a series of virtual meetings via YouTube this week to help parents understand the expectations for the reopen plan. And I'm sure that uh, Board of Education members and Dr. Adley um, would entertain any questions that you might have about that. Um, that's my report, Kate. Um, there is, well, there's been a lot going on, but you know, a lot lately was to do with the storm. Um, I did, after the last meeting survey, other towns in Connecticut to see who had reopened fully or partially. Um, and there are a few towns in Connecticut that have um, full access to their city halls. None in Fairfield County that I could find. Some towns don't, if they didn't respond to my survey, I went on, you know, in Fairfield County to look at their websites and um, not all towns had that information readily available, but the majority of the towns in Fairfield County, they're either close to the public period or they're like us by appointment only. I'm still looking at tying our reopening to the states going to phase three, but we'll also take a look at um, how things go with the school reopening, the hybrid, and when they move to, um, to full reopening. We do want to give our staff um, some lead time when we do go to increase public access here um, to be prepared, but I think we are generally ready. Ed's staff has done a terrific job with um, getting all the barriers we needed in place and getting all the um, hand sanitizer stations and such in place. Um, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. OK. Uh, old business, since we almost discussed this in the past. And I want to thank Ed for being so patient and listening to the discussion on the police accountability bill. Um, but our, action, our item is to discuss and take action on the proposed fats, oils, and grease ordinance. And bring Ed Gentile to the podium. Ed Gentile, Director of Public Works, thank you for having me and thank you for having Don go before me because that was uh, <laughs> actually pretty interesting to hear. Um, so it was uh, well worth the, uh, the time. Um, I hope you folks had a chance to look at the new version. We did make some, uh, some changes to it. Uh, um, the, the part I want to just kind of go over with you is, is how this actually came about, where it's coming from and where we're going with it. Um, the, uh, these new fats, oil, and grease regulations were vetted by our, our sewer commission, our town council, and staff. Um, and uh, we, we thought we've come up with a very simple um, fog regulation that we can actually uh, implement here in town. Um, it is re required by um, a sanitary sewer, CMOM, which is our compa capacity management operation maintenance uh, program that we're getting into right now. Um, it also follows best practices. Um, it was instituted with, by the DEP back in 2006 with a guidance document to follow. 
um, which was quite long and uh, had <laughs> had a ton of uh, sections that we didn't want to or tried to implement here. Um, we did uh, take Stanford's, which was put out in 2009 as an ordinance. We did take that and follow that one more closely. Um, we did that because we do send our our storm or I'm sorry, our sanitary sewer water to them. We, f we figured that was a good approach to, to get us started. Um, back in 2010, though, we did start doing um, inspections as part of the FOG program. Um, and, uh, and what we're uh, looking to do now is, is implement those um, as a formal documentation um, with, some, uh, with some teeth to it, uh, fines that go along with it if you're not following along um, and being compliant. There, there's just a couple sections I want to highlight because I think they're important. Um, classifications, they're in the definition as a class one, two, three, and four. Um, we do um, apply these regulations to class three and class fours. Um, you'll see part of this um, food service establishment definition, they don't specifically say three and four, and the reason they don't is the state's involved in updating the two and threes right now, so there's going to be a crossover. So the definitions are going to be what are included as far as exposure for potential hazards. Um, so we're, we're working with that. So we, we drew this up as following the section of the state public health code, which is important to us. Um, we, uh, we did have a question about uh, renderable fog. Um, I, I, want, I had to look that up, I'm sorry, I just, I'll admit to it. When I first started reading about this, I wanted to know what it meant. Um, there's renderable and un unrenderable. This is basically just clean oil or grease that comes from a restaurant that hasn't been contaminated um, completely by food. They can actually take some of this uh, um, material and uh, they make products out of it. And, um, there's, uh, there's pet food, cosmetics, soaps, things that kind of just kind of catch you by surprise when you, when you see it in writing. Um, there is a uh, violations definition, which I think is important because we're going to get to the fines in the back in a second. Um, we went through these um, and put a, a, a lot of past practices and issues we've had with restaurants in here to make sure that we covered what we could and made it easy to understand by the restaurant owners and the property owners of these places. Um, we did include in section 12.5 permits, we did uh, add a section C. Um, that later we could come back and institute a permit fee, but at this time the sewer commission did not feel it was appropriate due to the times that we're going through, the economic times, that we would go after a fee from the restaurants at this time. And it may come back sooner, maybe a year, maybe two years, but they will um, every once a year um, revisit this, this topic. There's a, there's a section in here under 1213 for compliance. Um, we, uh, we did have a question about the, the length of time, and I think it's important that we, we point out what the Sewer Commission was thinking at this time when they looked at a 14-day calendar day. Um, very important to get compliance. <clears throat> they didn't want to be heavy-handed about it. They also understand that sometimes these, um, these issues that arise in restaurants do take time to reconcile. And um, we're talking about plumbing issues, we're talking about major um, excavation in the back if you have an outside um, uh, containment unit, things like that. So they wanted to be fair. The other piece was that they meet once a month. They wanted to give us time as a staff to get it reconciled before coming to the board or the sewer commission themselves. Um, there is a section under um, 1213-7. There is an appeal process. If you are fined in any way, you can come to the sewer commission and present your case to them. We thought that was important. Um, just so you know, the process will be um, with these regulations. Once there are fines assessed or anything like that, any and all fines will be, will be reported to the sewer commission for approval of final application, which means we're not just going to fine you, send you a letter, inspect it back. I will present every single one. I hope there are not many. That's my hope. The ones we do have to uh, assess fines to, we hope to bring to the Sewer Commission and um, give them an opportunity to hear their, the story that we've come through and, and make sure that the fines are being applied uh, evenly. Um, we also uh, have found out that according to our town attorney, 
um, that these regulations will not need to go in front of the RTM for approval. Once approved by your board, um, they will be implemented. That's, uh, that's all I have. I'm um, sorry, one more thing. When this is approved um, and signed off, we do plan on notifying all the restaurants and property owners that we do inspections on, that there is a new regulations that are out there. Um, we're toying with the idea of sending them the uh, regulations or providing them a link. We may do both. Um, but we want to make sure that they all know what the rules are going forward and that there are no surprises um, as we head out. That's great. I appreciate that. That was going to be my question. How will you publicize? Okay, um, any, questions any questions for Ed on the new ordinance, Sarah? Quick question. Ed, we have had a fatberg in the past, right? Like, we have, where, was it near any residential areas? Like, do we need to be concerned? When the ordinance name really doesn't kind of focus specifically on the food service establishments, do we need to be concerned about residents with fats, oils, and greases? Or is this just primarily food service establishments? The, the, uh, the magnitude of what you need to clog a sewer yeah. is not going to be found in a single okay. residential okay. area. Okay. It's going to be found by um, the disposal of fats, oils, and greases in, in large Got quantities, it. It. not something that a residential unit would uh, most likely have. Krista, can you clarify when this actually takes effect? There's a, the last page of this, there's a date on, that goes in there. As soon as this is passed, um, and I approach the sewer commission for the sign off on this, which is their next meeting is the first week in September, I believe September 1st. Um, once approved by you folks, they will sign off on this and I'll put a date in there. Okay, and that will be after you've notified the community? We'll put a plan together to notify it. And the just the inspections there. part that, that come next usually happen a little bit later in the year. So we'll be able to, during September, get these out to them. Okay. Um, there's an opportunity that I could put something in our billing. Um, haven't really wanted to do that. I don't want to kind of put the two together. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that mm. little letter doesn't get read. The bill gets looked at, and the rest of it gets thrown out. So we're trying to uh, trying to come up with a method to get it out there. And I'm I'm starting to think that we should just stick with um, notifying them all in September as soon as they sign off on this bill. Okay. And is it correct that there's no fine? Did you say at this point until there's, the commission there's no, decides? There's no permit fee. Oh, fee, I'm sorry. Yeah, every year you have to register your restaurant or whatever mm -hmm. it is that's your food establishment. Um, we thought, uh, the sewer commission thought that it would not be appropriate at this time. Okay. Because right. the, the restaurants are struggling to stay in business. But the fine is applied. The fines are applied. Okay, all right, that's good. Thank you. Okay. And I've always wondered, reading this twice now, section 12 B2, uh, rentable facts. How do do you worry about distinguishing one from the other? Well, we all we assume, as a um, as the sewer commission had discussed, we assume that everything that you create goes down the drain. The right. people that are worried about it being renderable are the businesses that would come up and take your oils and make products out of them. Um, there are places. There's actually one place in New Haven that does dispose of them, but there's others that come around and actually collect your oils. Why, why are you concerned when you say no renderable fats, oils, or grease? Shall be discharged into the grease trap interceptors or ATRs. I mean, well, they want you to try to recycle them. That's the whole idea. Okay. Any other questions for Ed? <coughs> no. Okay. We have a motion. The board of selectmen approves. <coughs> excuse me. The sewer commission's proposed ordinance titled "Fats, Oils, and Grease Regulations." concerning the abatement of fats, oils, and grease discharge into public sewers. I'll entertain a motion to approve. May I yes. ask a question? Yes. Um, should we amend it so that it is reflecting the food service establishment um, by discharge by FSEs into public servers so that it's not reflected into by residents or that it's only re reflecting these, re these businesses rather? It may be too fine of a point, I'm just curious. The violations can only go against an FSE. Right. So, I mean. Okay, I just was curious. You can't have a violation from us. Okay. Person. I'm sorry, was the motion No, I think it was just a question. That okay, I no, 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 I just don't know where we stand. Okay. So, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Kit moves. I have a second. Sarah seconds. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstentions, motion carries. Okay, thank you, Pierre. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have a whole series of transfers, so I'm going to turn it to Kate for the transfers. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Beth. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, John. They're all fiscal 20. I'm sorry, they're all. I believe they're all fiscal 20. Okay. Do you need to come up to the mic? Yes, please. So, Kate, for the year ending this past June. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the first one is related to COVID expenses for the emergency management department. The source is um, just underspent in a lot of areas. You know, understand that at a certain point when we went into a virtual shutdown, we did stop a lot of spending, uh, which is why the funds would be available. And um, obviously, the emergency management department had to ramp up, and that's why we needed the transfer there. Any questions on this emergency management transfer? It's a transfer of $15,507 from a series of accounts into program expense. And the big part is from the Board of Finance Contingency Fund, the last item. Correct. Yes. Okay. Any questions on this transfer? I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Kip moves, may I second? Sarah seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next one is for overtime at the transfer station. And um, again, it's COVID um, because we were alternating our staff um, and we had to alternate the personnel. We had to have traffic control to address the social distancing um, issues. So it required more personnel. This is a transfer of $5,583 from solid waste disposal to overtime public works. Any further questions on this transfer? Could you just explain why we don't need the money in solid waste disposal now? That's our, um, what it costs us to, for us to dump. So it's a, that number is, um, you know, we estimated at the beginning of the year, it's a, it's a pretty big number in the budget. And it's based on tonnage, how much we haul out. So um, we just didn't haul out as much. Of course, on the other side, that means we probably have less in fees mm -hmm. on the revenue side. But if you look at your budget, that's a very big number. Right. So this is a very small um, percentage of that. So we can review that in the next budget to see if we need the budgeted amount. Well. A five thousand dollars swing in that number, and, and we're talking, you know, like several hundred thousand dollars. Right. No, I just I'm talking about the overall budget number, depending on how much is left in the account at the end of the fiscal year, if we're budgeting properly for that. That's all. Um, I mean, on the flip side, for the overtime, do we is this an ongoing? Is this problem abated now? Um, how are we doing? Well, we're back to full staffing. Right. Um, right. I think we're still having some issues with social distancing in mm -hmm. the area. Um, we put up signage to encourage people to wear masks, and we encourage people to maintain a proper social distance. Um, so I'd have to, I'm not quite sure how big a problem it remains, but it, I do know it has been a problem. Okay, so we don't have the overtime issue anymore? Not to my knowledge. Okay. We may have some additional expenses, though, associated with this storm. And well, this storm, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, 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 I meant more just on yeah. COVID policing personnel. and. One would hope we don't at this point. Yeah. Running up but overtime. Seems, yeah, as we, we will have overtime issues because, as James said, we are open the last two Saturdays later, and we are going to actually be open late again this Saturday. Okay, no, no, completely different reasons. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, motion to approve this transfer. So Sarah yeah. moves. Second. Kip seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Kate, these two COVID expenditures, um, are we using these to file for any reimbursable yes. expenses? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next up I have heating fuel, $6,867. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, the um, we needed more heat in the, um, the truck base than we had anticipated. 
um, better circulation for the air. So this is something is you know we're getting used to the new building. This is part of the the the, uh, the addition. Um, so it's just something they didn't anticipate. And you know to sort of follow on Krista's questioning, um, why the balance in streetlight maintenance? I'm going to say we, we estimate how much we might have to spend in streetlight maintenance, and we just haven't spent it. Um, it. Again, we're pretty new to having responsibility mm -hmm. for the streetlights, and Ed budgets based on an assumption of how many streetlights we'll have to replace, like how many poles or yep. how much work we'll have to do. So we've done better than what we had estimated. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve a transfer of $6,867 from streetlight maintenance to heating fuel. David moves. I have a second. Second. Sarah seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Tree maintenance? Um, from tree maintenance yep. to equipment repair, um, reading the explanation, we had to repair the exhaust system on some of the larger trucks due to meet the need to meet the state's emission standards. Hmm. This is a transfer of five thousand eight hundred and seventy-nine dollars from tree maintenance to equipment repair and maintenance. Any further questions? Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Kip moves. We have a sec. David seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, unemployment is something that's very difficult for us to um, budget because we don't know what the year is going to bring in this year brought It brought a lot. Um, we did have, well, um, we didn't have any layoffs of permanent personnel. We did um, have part-time people who, um, because of the COVID shutdown, um, were not working. Um, so we, some of this is from two separations from employees that um, left our employee, whether voluntarily or not. Um, and then the others is from the public health emergency, and I do have the notes. The way of doing that, how does someone getting uh, separated get unemployment benefits? It's really complicated. So, okay. no, it's not really complicated, but it is very difficult for us to win those cases. Um, well, they claim it. They claim it, yeah, they claim it, and okay. we fight them, oh, and, okay. Okay. Um, okay. yeah. Kate, the medical insurance piece, were we overpaying? Did we change, like what was the difference of the 21,000? So when we, Sorry. when we budget for medical insurance, we go through every employee, what coverage level they have, right. um, and what the premiums are, what their shares are going to be. And then there are changes during the year. Um, it might have been, you know, we might have gotten our numbers close to the budget and not changed it. You know, maybe the premiums came in favorable, but oftentimes, you know, if you have people leave or people change, um, there are variables up and down. Okay. Um, so, of the, that number, $3,484 was related to um, COVID unemployment. I'm sorry, can you give me that number again? $3,484. Okay. Again, a potentially reimbursable expense or not unemployment? That I don't think is going to be yeah, reimbursable. Yeah, I don't think so either. Okay. Um, transfer of $21,672 from medical insurance to unemployment compensation. Motion to approve? So moved. David moves. I have a second. Sarah seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. And the last one is paramedic services, $7,960. Um, for those of you who are newer to the board, our contract requires that we pay um, SEMS, Stanford Emergency Medical Services, the difference between what they can bill for, um, for the services and what's actually paid with a cap of $425,000. So, 
I'm sorry, they're guaranteed $425,000. So what they don't get from billing, we have to make up. And wow. we make an estimate in the budget as to what percentage we'll end up having to pay. And so we were slightly under this year. That's in fascinating. Our estimates. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. I said that's fascinating. I had no idea. So if we had, let's say, we had an amazing year and everyone was very healthy, and we had a third of the people that were to use the ambulance, we would still then be required to pay. Yeah, because we would be paying for Got the yeah. next fee. I understand. No, I'm just curious. Yeah. Thank you. It's like a contracted service. Absolutely. It, it wasn't. A, well, over the years, there's been um, challenges with the billing service. So yes. we have, over the years, had to pay significantly more than we do now because. You know, Kate's worked hard on yeah. working with Post 53 to change their billing service. And I'm going to give credit to past members of the Board of Finance who um, took on some of the problems of the billing service and fought to make the letters more clear about the billing, um, mm -hmm. you know, that they weren't paying the post, they were paying for the paramedics, right. and fought to get them um, billed more regularly, more promptly, sometimes maybe more aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, Follow up on delinquent billings, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, some, sometimes it could, it could be pretty huge numbers and oftentimes it'd be dropped on us on June 29th. I remember I was going to a conference and I was in an airport and got a phone call letting me know how, that the bill had just come in and it was gonna be like $50,000 over budget. <laughs> yeah. So this is a much, you know, I think we're getting great service to our residents, and we have um, a much better handle on what it costs. For Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it's once a year we go through this. No, we, we pay them on a quarterly basis. Oh, quarterly. Mm -hmm. But this is just to make up, make make whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We reconcile yes. on an annual yes. basis. Yeah. So this is a transfer of seven thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars from Board of Finance contingency to paramedic services. Motion to approve. So moved. Kip moves. A second. Second. David seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I do believe at your next meeting we should have the last of the fiscal 20 cleanup transfers. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to appointments. We have a recommendation to appoint Kevin Treesh. Actually, it is the, the actual process is uh, for us to recommend that Kevin Treesh go before the RTM for appointment to the Western Tourism District for term ending June 30th of 2022. Motion to approve Kevin's recommendation. So, Sarah moves. I have a second. Second. Krista, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, the reappointment of uh, Lorene Bora to the Parks and Rec Commission for a term ending March 31st, 2023. So moved. Krista moves. Second. Second. Kip, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. And uh, the appointment of a member uh, Jamie, to the I'm going to be a, I'm going to be opposed on that. You're going to oppose Lori's reappointment. Yep. Okay. 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 And um, tonight we're going to appoint a member to the police commission for a term ending of June. I think it's June 30th, 2023, not June 20th. Um, we had the privilege of interviewing two great candidates for this position. Uh, the incumbent, Kevin Cunningham, who's been serving for a little under a year, and Sherrod Sammy. Um, had great interviews with those gentlemen. <coughs> uh, had some discussion amongst the board, and I'm prepared to move the appointment of Kevin Cunningham to serve for the term ending of June 30th, 2023. May I have a second for Kevin's appointment? Second. Kip seconds. Okay. Um, are there any other nominations? I'd like to move a nomination for Sherrod Sammy to Police Commissioner. Okay. Is there a second for Sherrod's nomination? Second. 
Okay, thank you. All right, is there any discussion? Any discussion? Okay, hearing no discussion, <clears throat> um, we will vote. Uh, we will do a roll call vote for the police commission. So um, I will ask for a vote from David Martin. You would like to vote for Sherrod since you moved his. Correct. Or you seconded his nomination. And Sarah, vote for Sherrod. Um, I'm going to vote for Kevin Cunningham. Krista? Kevin Cunningham. Okay. And Kip? Uh, Kevin Cunningham. Okay. okay, Kevin Cunningham is our new appointee to the Darien Police Commission. All right, we have minutes of our special meeting of August 3rd. Only corrections, I would say at the top, the time should be 6 15 and not 7 o'clock. The um, special meeting. The special meeting. Oh, yeah, you know, in fact, I'll even just take that whole line out. That's, no it. That's it. Okay. Motion to approve as amended. So moved. Kip, second. Sarah, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and we have regular meeting minutes of August 3rd. Jamie, in your second paragraph, you at the very end, it says astronomical blue tide at, and there's a blank. Wasn't there a time? Ah, I'll have to go back and look that up. I just thought. Thank you. Whatever. Just don't miss that. Yep. No, that's a biggie. Actually, let's just delete the word at. Okay, that's fine. Yep. <clears throat> Any other corrections or additions? Did I abstain from the vote on waiving the competitive bidding requirement? No, we decided no, that no. we didn't need I to. Said that's what you didn't need to. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for reminding me. Otherwise, no. no else. Okay. Um, motion to approve as amended. So moved. David moves. May I have a second? Second. Kip. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Kate, do we have any public comment or anyone registered for public comment this evening? We do not. <coughs> Agenda review. Once. We do we meet again on September 14th? Is that September the next thing? September 14th? Is that the next thing? Actually, you have quite a break. I feel like that's a long break. Um, I'm not sure that's right. <clears throat> we don't meet on the, the 30th of, uh, of August? No, you're only required to have two meetings a month, not every other. Okay. Um, do you see a reason for us to meet before? It seemed like a long time. No, it just seemed like a long time. Yeah. You know, really, it's. The Labor Day is falling as late as it can, yep. and that's the reason, because that first Monday in September is Labor Day. Okay. But we get we get a vacation. Okay. You should have a vacation. Yep. Certainly don't wait though. If there's something that comes of up course. in the meantime Absolutely. that would sure. require us to get together, special meeting, something you want to add to agenda, would be a please. There's no um, conflict on the 14th with. Where's it young couple? The following weekend. Um, you know, we had a discussion. The following um, day. Sorry. I, I it's don't. The following Monday. I think it may be the following. It's the following Monday. Okay. Yeah, I recall we we considered holidays when setting the calendar. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, RTM is on the twenty first, at least in my calendar. Yeah, and you're on the twenty eighth. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. When, Kate, when do you and your team start putting together budgets? Is it towards the fall? Like, is it later? Um, some departments will actually probably start like no. October. Okay. You know, uh, you know, most people are. You know, if there's if it's a big if it's a capital project, they're already thinking about it. Um, but you'll get some of the bigger departments. You know, might start in October. Um, 
we mandate that they be turned into us in December. So we usually go through some training with department heads in advance of the budget. In, um, in October, we did it last year. You know, sometimes we've done it in November, but we decided they needed a little bit more time. Um, Just wondering if we should talk about the need for a town to have a chief information officer. Certainly there was so much that happened this year, so. Um, it may or may not be something that people are interested in. I just was curious. And which one was we talking about? Chief Information Officer. I'm oh. talking very quietly. So. I'd love to entertain that. Yeah, I do, have, I do have a draft of the technology assessment. Um, oh, yeah, that'll be good. And um, that is discussed in there. Yep. Um, that would be helpful. That would be something. Is it uh, in a format uh, that it's ready for us to see? Uh, you know, there were some things I wanted them to correct or okay. change, and um, so we'll be getting another draft back. So that would be a, um, just for agenda review. I know it's not exactly the Board of Finance is going to be looking over the summer at some of their accounts. Did they come back to you? Do we have a? I haven't been following it from their perspective, but just um, an update. Um, well, you know what they do, what they do. I think what you're referring to is they look at the capital not recurring accounts. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, they canceled their August meeting, so I expect they won't be looking at those until September. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought they were saying they're going to be doing that over the summer. Okay. Yeah, I do know. You know, we all got um, all the department heads got requests to justify keeping any um, capital accounts that were over a certain amount or over a certain age, basically. You know, mm -hmm. budgeted a couple of years ago that you haven't spent yet. Um, so we had to justify keeping those. Um, so that's part of the review. And um, I think you'll hear more about it as you get into the budget season. Okay, fine. I just was curious how that went and from your perspective. Not detailed, but just sort of an overview of how the process went and yeah, anything. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see what they say. Okay. Are the materials that they were reviewing available to us? Um, I would assume they, they're public documents, so um, I don't have them. Um, where but if you, you have a if guess you contact where the finance department, I'm sure Jen okay. will, you know, share them with you. Great, thanks. Okay. Do we want to circle back and reports from selectmen? So we can sure. Just in case. Just, just okay. cross it off. Over that. Um, did anybody have anything they wanted to report from their various liaison positions? Driving Youth Task Force next meets in September. I think really the major was Kip. Was there any update? We're having a meeting Thursday. Okay. It'll be wonderful. We have, we have a lot we're doing. I'll be having more to tell you in September. Yeah. Great. A lot will have happened. Yes. I hope. Okay. Um, I always like uh, after the close of the fiscal year, Kate, if we could at some point, and maybe it makes sense to wait until after the next Board of Finance meeting, so that pushes it to the end of September, to have Jen come and talk to us and sort of recap the fiscal year uh, and talk to us about accounts and you know our overall financial status and all of those things. Um, and, but that's probably too soon to do. I know we were going to do some budget, you know, interim budget reviews. I want to make sure that we don't lose track of that either, so that we're keeping tabs on on the budget as we go along. Yeah, we had decided that we would begin those reviews after the first quarter. Okay. Um, and we've talked about certain accounts that we feel are good indicators mm -hmm. um, of where we might have concerns, um, some that traditionally, you know, could sway things one way or another. Um, if you got a lot of lawsuits, you know, that's going to be a big expense. Um, so that's when we planned to start and keep okay. in mind these things. Okay. That's great. All right. Anything else for agenda review? All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Just a second. Sarah, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you very much. Thank you.